A very good evening, viewers and aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis brought to you by Shankar Ice Academy. And today we'll be covering the Hindu newspaper dated 7th of April 2022. And I have taken these news articles for discussion today. Many of them are important from both prelims and mains perspective. From the international relations angle, I have taken this editorial article and followed by that we'll be discussing about the presidents of India and Sri Lanka in this next discussion. Then we'll be seeing about Mission Vatsalya in the third discussion which is based on this editorial article. And then following that we'll be discussing about a Tibetan committee to which India provides grants in aid in this discussion. And finally we'll be ending the discussion with few facts about common university entrance test. And at the end of this news article discussion, I have the practice prelims question discussion also, followed by which we'll be taking up the quiz question for today. So now let's get to the first discussion. So this discussion is based on the editorial article, which is on India-Nepal relationship. Why this article has been written? It is because recently only the Nepalese Prime Minister visited India. And remember, this is his first bilateral visit after he became Prime Minister of Nepal. So in this editorial author has discussed about the outcomes of this visit he also mentions about the growing influence of China in Nepal and finally he has mentioned certain measures that need to be taken by India to revamp India Nepal relationship so let us see all these points in this discussion now why this discussion is important particularly it is important from the mains perspective here you can look at the two questions that appeared in 2014 and 2015 in GS paper 3 and GS paper 2. These were the questions framed by UPSC because our current Prime Minister came to power in 2014 and since then he has been focusing on neighborhood first policy. So these questions become relevant in that aspect and also the last Nepal specific question in Mainz was asked in 2012. So you can expect that this time there might be a question about Nepal or India-Nepal relationship or uh, India and its neighborhood relationship in general. So for all these types of questions, you can find points in this current discussion. So pay attention here. So now this is the syllabus under which this discussion can be brought in. Let us start the discussion now. We all know that historically India and Nepal have had pretty smooth relationships. But recently, that is to be specific, after 2015, India-Nepal relationship has been going through highs and lows. It started when Indian media insensitively covered the 2015 Nepal earthquake. See, during 2015 Nepal earthquake, India was the largest donor to Nepal. In addition to this, Operation Maitri was also a huge success. See, this Operation Maitri was a rescue and relief operation in Nepal by the government of India and the Indian Armed Forces after the 2015 earthquake. But despite all this, the insensitive coverage by Indian media tarnished India's good image among Nepalese public. And after this only, India was blamed for interfering with Nepalese constitution. Then there was also an official blockade of Nepal by India. And in addition to this, there was also growing Chinese presence in Nepal. So since 2015, India-Nepal relations have not been very good. And particularly, the former Prime Minister of Nepal exploited this situation. So who was the former Prime Minister of Nepal? Mr. K.P. Sharma Oli. He reinforced the notion that there cannot be Nepali nationalism without anti-Indianism. That is, he said that Nepali nationalism and anti-Indianism are two sides of the same coin. So he was turning Nepalese against Indians. So all these factors make the current visit of the incumbent Nepalese Prime Minister very significant. But in this visit, the divisive issues between India and Nepal were not discussed. So it attained many positive outcomes. Let us see these positive outcomes now. The most important outcome is the cross-border rail link. See a 35 kilometer cross-border rail link from Jayanagar to Kurta was uh, operationalized. Here the Jayanagar is in Bihar and Kurta is in Nepal. And this is the first broad gauge cross-border rail link between India and Nepal. In the future, this railway line will be extended to two other municipalities in Nepal. They will be Bijalpur and Bardibas. So Bijalpur and Bardibas are in Nepal. Now this railway line is aimed at boosting people to people linkages. It will also further boost the trade and commerce activities between the two countries. And it also holds certain cultural and historical significance because there are total eight stations and halls in this uh, Jayanagar Kurta section. And uh, it also involves the important city of Janakpur. See this Janakpur is believed to be the birthplace of Sita. 
So this Janakpur has many temples. So due to this cross border rail link, it is expected that both sides will have tourists as well as pilgrimages who will be using this railroad. And due to these potentials, the operationalization of this railway line is the most significant outcome of Nepal PM's visit. So this was the first important outcome. Now the second one is the concessional loan for the construction of double circuit transmission line. So this is important because Nepal is planning to export its excess hydropower to India. You all know that water resources are considered as the backbone of Nepali economy because Nepal has uh, many perennial rivers and the rugged geography of Nepal also makes it ideal for hydropower production. And that is why it is planning to export its excess hydropower to India. And to make this dream come true, Nepal needs huge investments, especially in the transmission lines. So India provided a concessional loan of 200 crore rupees through its Export-Import Bank of India, that is Exim Bank. And this loan was used for the construction of a 90 kilometer long, 132 kilovolt double circuit transmission line. This transmission line connects Tila to Mirchaya. This Tila is in Solukumbu and Mirchaya is in Siraha. Here you can see Solukumbu and Siraha. Solukumbu is in the northern part of Nepal where there is huge hydropower potential. Whereas Siraha is in the southern part of Nepal and it is located in India-Nepal border. So this double circuit transmission line is mainly for ensuring the export of Nepalese hydroelectric power to India. Now this outcome is to be seen along with the US Millennial Challenge Corporation. So this was an agreement signed by the Nepalese Prime Minister. Through this agreement, Nepal will receive a grant of $500 million. And this grant will be used for building 318 kilometer of high voltage transmission lines along with the substations. This is important for India because once these transmission lines are established, then buying hydroelectric power from Nepal will be cheaper and less polluting for India than building a new thermal power station in India. So the second major outcome was concessional loan for the construction of double circuit transmission line. The next outcome is regarding the Mahakali Treaty. So this treaty was signed in 1996 between India and Nepal. As you know, this Mahakali is the name of a river which originates in Nepal. This Mahakali River forms the border between the two countries for a considerable distance. And this is recognized by the treaty. Along with it, the scope of the treaty also covers uh, Sarada Barrage, the Tanakpur Barrage and the proposed Pancheshwar project. Now the issue was, even though this treaty was signed in 1996, the implementation of the treaty is very slow. And here the Pancheshwar project is important because it is a $7 billion project with a power production capacity of 6,700 megawatts. So, as a result of the recent visit by Nepalese Prime Minister, both the sites have agreed to push for an early finalization of the detailed project report. And if this Pancheshwar project is completed, it has huge potential in cross-border transmission linkages and coordination between the national grids. So, these were the three main outcomes. Along with this, uh, agreements were also signed for providing technical cooperation in the railway sector. Then uh, it was also ensured that Nepal will be inducted into the International Solar Alliance. Then an agreement was also signed between Indian Oil Corporation and Nepal Oil Corporation. So this will ensure regular supply of petroleum products. And these were the important outcomes of Nepalese Prime Minister's visit to India. Now let us see some of the steps taken by the Chinese government to increase its influence in Nepal. See, as I said in the beginning, the former Prime Minister of Nepal did not have a great relationship with India. Rather, he increased Nepal's relationship with China. And for that, he even visited Beijing in 2016, where he negotiated an agreement on transit transportation. And three years later, a protocol was also concluded between Nepal and China. According to this protocol, Nepal was provided access to four seaports and three land ports of China. Then in 2017, the Chinese Defense Minister visited Nepal for the first time. After this visit, a joint military exercise was conducted between Nepal and China. Along with this, China also announced a military grant of $32 million for Nepal. And also in the sphere of economy, China recently overtook India. It overtook India as the largest source of FDI in Nepal. And uh, China is also involved in airport expansion projects at Pokhara and Lumbini. 
so all these shows that china is trying to increase its influence on nepal and according to the author of the editorial instead of competing with china india must resolve its differences with nepal and india should up its own game so in this manner author has pointed out three issues in india nepal relationships and he has told us how these issues can be resolved and the first among these issues is regarding the 1950 treaty of peace and friendship so whenever we talk about india nepal relationship we always talk about 1950 treaty of peace and friendship this treaty provides for an open border between india and nepal and this treaty allows nepali nationals to have the right to work in india so although this treaty was signed with good intentions today this treaty is viewed as a sign of an unequal relationship and an indian imposition so according to the author this treaty must be revised to reflect the present nature of the relationship between india and nepal actually efforts were already taken for updating this treaty in 2016 at that period an eight member eminent persons group was set up even though this group has submitted its report further steps have not been taken yet so author is of the opinion that there is no progress regarding this treaty so he is suggesting two things first is making this report available to the public and second through this author is suggesting to kick start the track to diplomacy what is track to diplomacy it is also called as back channel diplomacy it is nothing but a practice in which there is informal and unofficial contacts and activities between private citizens or group of individuals so this is in contrast to the track one diplomacy what is track one it is the official governmental diplomacy that occurs inside official government channels and in between these two we also have a track 1.5 diplomacy these involves the conversations that include a mix of government officials and non governmental experts here the government officials participate in an unofficial capacity and all the officials including the government and non governmental experts they all sit around the same table and discuss the matter so regarding the 1950 treaty author is suggesting to use the track to diplomacy for renegotiating the treaty this was the first issue and the first solution now the second issue is regarding the demonetization see we discussed this fact on our april 1st in the news analysis you can listen to that analysis to see what is this issue i am not going to repeat it again and according to the author the solution to this issue is arriving at a mutually satisfactory solution and the last major issue pointed out by author is the boundary issue between nepal and india we know the boundary issue is with respect to the kalapani matter we discussed this also on our first april in the news analysis so please view that analysis so that you can link those points with today's discussion now regarding this issue a solution can only be arrived to this problem only if any expression on territorial nationalism is avoided on both sides that is by both india and nepal so after avoiding any expression on territorial nationalism both india and nepal must lay groundwork for a quiet dialogue on this matter this is the third solution provided by the author so these are the points that we have to take note from the editorial discussion in today's discussion we saw the important outcomes of uh, nepali's prime minister's visit to india what were the outcomes first outcome was the cross border rail link from jayanagar in bihar to kurta in nepal it will have many benefits like it will boost people to people linkages it will boost trade and commerce it will also increase the influx of tourists and pilgrims and second outcome is the concessional loan for construction of double circuit transmission line this will enable export of hydropower from nepal to india and this transmission line was constructed from tila in sulokumbu to mirchaya in siraha and the third outcome is regarding the mahakali treaty especially some of the components of the treaty which are regarding sarada barrage tanakpur barrage and the proposed pancheshwar project and uh, both sides have agreed to push for an early finalization of detailed project report on this mahakali treaty then there was an agreement for uh, technical cooperation in railway sector then uh, nepal's induction into international solar alliance was ensured then an agreement was also signed between indian and nepal oil corporations these were the outcomes then we saw about the influence of china in nepal in that we saw that nepal was provided access to four sea ports and three land ports of china and then uh, joint military exercises between nepal and china were conducted after 2017 and then 
China provided military grant of 32 million dollars for Nepal. Then China also overtook India as the largest source of FDI in Nepal. Then we saw that it also has two airport expansion projects at Pokhara and Lumbini. Then finally we saw what are the issues between India and Nepal and how they should be solved. And the first issues regarding the 1950 Treaty of Peace and Friendship. According to the author, this treaty must be revised to reflect the present nature of relationship between the countries. And second suggestion is using track to diplomacy to renegotiate the treaty. The second issue which we saw was the demonetization issue between India and Nepal and for this a mutual solution that is satisfactory to the both sides have to be arrived at. And the third issue was the boundary issue and regarding this author has told that territorial nationalism should be kept out of uh, the talks and then a groundwork for a quiet dialogue should be started in this matter. So these were the points in this discussion. Now let us get to the next one. So now let us take up this news article. This article is regarding the economic crisis in Sri Lanka. We have already seen that Sri Lanka is facing a severe economic crisis, right? So now the people of Sri Lanka are asking for the resignation of Sri Lankan President Gotabaya Rajapaksha. To this demand, the chief government whip of Sri Lanka has said that the president has no reason to resign in Sri Lankan parliament. So we are not going to discuss the issue here, rather we are going to take this opportunity and we are going to compare the features of uh, Indian President and Sri Lankan President like we will be discussing about the term of office, the election procedure etc etc. So let us start now. See first of all, we all know that in India the Indian President is only the head of the state and the head of the government is the Indian Prime Minister. But in case of Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan president is both the head of the state as well as the head of the government. So this is the first difference between Indian president and Sri Lankan president. Now next if we come to the election process, here also the procedure is quite different. First if we take the Indian president, the president is elected by the electoral college. This is as per article 54 of Indian constitution. Now this electoral college consists of elected members of both the houses of parliament and the elected members of legislative assemblies of these states. And what is the procedure in which the president is elected in India? As per article 55 of Indian constitution, the Indian president is elected by proportional representation by single transferable vote. Now what about Sri Lankan president? See, the Sri Lankan president is directly elected by the people by an instant runoff voting system. So, what is this instant runoff voting system? In this system, the electors, that is the people, will rank the candidates who are running for presidential election. They will rank them in an order of preference up to three candidates. So, here the candidate who obtains over 50% of the first preference will win the presidency. And then that candidate will be appointed as the president. But what if no candidate receives an overall majority of first preference votes? Then in such a scenario, except the two leading candidates, all the remaining candidates will be eliminated and their votes will be redistributed among the leading candidates. Now this will help to determine a winner in the second and the final round. Now coming to the term of office, this is provided in Article 56 of Indian Constitution. According to it, Indian president has a term of five years, but Sri Lankan president has a term of six years. Then can the president be re-elected in India and Sri Lanka? Yes, actually they can be re-elected. And this is as per article 57 of Indian constitution in case of Indian president. So in India, how many times the president can be re-elected? It is for any number of times actually. But in case of Sri Lanka, there is an upper limit. The Sri Lankan president can hold office for only two terms. So after two terms, sure he cannot be re-elected. And finally, what will happen if there is casual vacancy of president? Now in India, this is dealt by Article 65. And as per this article, during casual vacancies of the Indian president, it is the vice president who discharges the functions and duties of the president. So here the vice president is given the charge of the president. But in case of Sri Lanka, during the casual vacancy, the president may appoint the prime minister of Sri Lanka to exercise, perform and discharge powers, duties and functions of the office of president. So in India, vice president is given the charge, but in Sri Lanka, the prime minister is given that charge. So these are some of the comparisons and differences among the Indian president and Sri Lankan president. See, these points will be helpful for you in your prelims and particularly in mains answer writing. 
Why? Because our main syllabus also covers the area of comparison of Indian constitutional scheme with other constitutions. So that is why I took this article today. With these points in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. So now our discussion is going to be based on this editorial article. It is actually a criticism on the schemes that are focused on child and woman development. Particularly, here author points out a complication in Mission Vatsalya. And this complication is regarding the implementation of the child line. So to understand the article, let us see about Mission Vatsalya first. Then we will see the issues in the child line implementation. Now the syllabus that is relevant to this discussion is given here. So that you can understand the relevance of this topic to UPSC preparation. Now this Mission Vatsalya is one of the new triad of schemes along with Mission Shakti and Mission Potion 2.0. So what are these Mission Shakti, Mission Potion 2.0 and Vatsalya? See these are the schemes under which all major schemes of the Ministry of Women and Child Development were brought under for their effective implementation in financial year 2021-22. That is in the last financial year only all the major schemes of the Ministry were brought under these three schemes. Now among these we are going to focus on Mission Vatsalya. So here Vatsalya means affection and this has schemes focused on children. And the main aim of Mission Vatsalya is securing a healthy and happy childhood for every child. Now it focuses on children because they are one of the supreme national assets. And we also know that India is home to 472 million children and they comprise 39 percentage of the total population. So keeping this in mind, the objectives of the mission has been framed. As I already said, securing a healthy and happy childhood for every child is the first objective. Along with it, it also aims to foster a sensitive, supportive and synchronized ecosystem for development of children. Then it also aims to assist the states or unit territories in delivering the mandate of Juvenile Justice Act of 2015. And through all these initiatives, the mission also strives to achieve the SDG goals that is sustainable development goals, particularly those ones which are focused on children. So now this mission Vatsalya has several components because protecting a child has many components. So in that manner, its components include statutory bodies, then service delivery structures. It also has institutional care or institutional services and there are also non-institutional community based care then there is emergency outreach services then there is also training and capacity building under the mission and there are many programs that fulfill all these components we are not going to get into that today but you have to know that the mission Vatsalya actually covers an already existing scheme of the government which is the integrated child protection scheme so this integrated child protection scheme or the ICPS. It was launched in 2009 and it was aimed at supporting the children in difficult circumstances. And this is a centrally sponsored scheme with a view of building a protective environment for children. And this is done through government civil society partnership. So in this manner ICPS institutionalizes essential services and strengthens structures it enhances capacities at all levels. It creates a database and knowledge base for child protection services. It also strengthens child protection at family and community level. And then it ensures appropriate intersectoral response at all levels. So now you may think this is what we saw under Mission Vatsalya also. Yes, exactly. This ICPS is now under Mission Vatsalya. So their components and strategies are one and all the same. So, for example, under the ICPS scheme, the institutional care is provided through child care institutions. And this is done as a rehabilitative measure. And many other programs and services include uh, age-appropriate education, access to vocational training, recreation, health care, counseling, etc. So, these come under the institutional care or the institutional services. Now, under the non-institutional care, support is extended for adoption, foster care and sponsorship. And as part of this only, the child line was also functioning. So what is this child line? It is the child line 1098. As you know, 1098 is a phone number that spells hope for millions of children across India. This child line is a helpline. So it is a 24-hour service that is provided 365 days a year. It is free and it is an emergency phone service for children who are in need of aid and assistance. Now this helpline responds to the emergency needs of children but along with this it also links those children to relevant services for their long term care and rehabilitation. 
Now, the nodal agency of the Union Ministry of Women and Child Development that is uh, responsible for setting up, managing and monitoring the child line is the Child Line India Foundation, that is CIF. So, this is the sole body responsible for establishing child line services across the country. It also monitors the service delivery. It finances the child line. It also trains and does research and documentation. It creates awareness, etc., etc. I note that this child line service has received a special mention in the Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act of 2015. But how this child line functions? It functions under a unique model, which is a public-private model of operation. It works in partnership between the Government of India, Department of Telecommunications, international organizations, voluntary agencies, academic institutes, corporate sector, the community, etc. So this was what? happening so far but now the icps is under mission vatsalya and that is why the author is saying that its implementation will have many issues particularly the implementation of child line is expected to face many issues now why issues before that you have to know that the child line will be staffed by the home ministry under mission vatsalya and the reason provided for this is the need to preserve data sensitivity See, we know that the children who call the child line provides certain sensitive data along with their personal data. So, stating that we need to protect this data, government is bringing child line to be staffed by the Home Affairs Ministry. Now, along with this, it is also expected that police personnel will first attend the call or they will answer the call and then later implementation will be handed over to NGOs. Now, here involving police at initial stages of child line is an issue. And this issue was previously addressed by the child line. That is why a separate setup was maintained by the child line. And only in the end, when there was a need for police assistance, the police were called. But now, according to the author of the editorial, the police personnel will first answer the call. But why this is an issue cited by the author? It is first because children do not feel comfortable confiding in police personnel. That is, it is difficult for them to tell the police personnel what has happened to them. We know that making a child talk is a big task and for that repeated efforts have to be made. So we may not be sure whether the child will talk to the police personnel also due to the fear a child has on a police. So here the main objective of the child line is itself defeated. Because if the child doesn't confide then how will we know what is the issue with the child and how will we provide her assistance. Now, there is also another issue with uh, police assistance at the initial stages. It is because it will burden the police force. See, actually, this fact is stated based on an experiment that was conducted in Chennai in 2003. And it was found that making police personnel involved in the initial stages of child line actually burdens the police force. Here, the police will be overburdened not because they are not willing to assist, but because most of the time the child just wants to talk to someone. And often, in such cases, police intervention is not needed. So once the child talks to someone, the child gets a clarity. And if it is essentially a situation where police intervention is needed, then it can be called in. Otherwise, it is deemed unnecessary. So the issues that will be faced by the child line is police personnel attending the call. Now keeping this in mind, the government should implement the child line scheme because as of the data available on the child line website, 3 million children across the nation were offered care and protection by the child line services. So if this service is to continue with the intended benefits, then government should look into the issues we just discussed now. So with all these facts, I'm ending this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about Mission Vatsalya. We saw what is it. Then we saw it subsumes the ICPS, that is Integrated Child Protection Service. And this ICPS has many components and one among them is Emergency Outreach Services, which is provided by the Child Line 1098. So far, it was under the Union Ministry of Women and Child Development and its uh, management was with Child Line India Foundation. But now, under the mission with Salya, it is said that the Child Line will be staffed by the Home Ministry officials, especially by police personnel who will be answering the first call. And we saw why it is an issue. It is an issue because the child do not comfortable talking to the police personnel in the first place. And second, it also burdens the police force. So with these facts in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. So now let us take up this news article. 
It says that Union government has extended the scheme to provide grants in aid to Dalai Lama Central Tibetan Relief Committee. This scheme provides 40 crore grants in aids to this committee and now it is uh, extended up to fiscal year 2025-26. So in this regard let us see few facts about this Central Tibetan Relief Committee. Now before that let us see briefly about the Tibet issue. See after China occupied Tibet over 80,000 Tibetans were able to safely follow Dalai Lama in exile. This happened in 1959 and after that a government was formed for these exiled people and it is called the Central Tibetan Administration. It is also called as the Tibet government in exile. Now the most important task of uh, Dalai Lama along with this government was to provide relief to thousands of traumatized and dislocated Tibetan refugees. So this led to the establishment of the Department of Home under this government. It is one of the first departments to be established and it was given the huge important task of coordinating relief and rehabilitation works for thousands of Tibetan refugees. See these Tibetan refugees fled from Tibet to neighboring countries that is to India, Nepal and Bhutan. Then in the year 1981 the Central Tibetan Relief Committee was formed. It was formed because the Department of Home had huge work to do and to give a legal standing to its activities this committee was formed. Actually this committee is registered as charitable society under Indian Societies Registration Act of 1860 and this committee acts as the relief and development wing of the home department of Central Tibetan Administration that is the Tibetan government in exile. So in this manner this committee which is the Dalai Lama Central Tibetan Relief Committee is a non-profit organization which is dedicated to welfare and socio-economic development of 1,40,000 Tibetan refugees who are exiled in India, Nepal and Bhutan. And it is the reliefing of uh, Central Tibetan Administration. It is dedicated to preserve the cultural and religious heritage of Tibet. It also aims to build and maintain sustainable democratic communities in exile. Now this committee has certain objectives. Its basic aim and objective is to promote and assist in the upliftment of the poor, needy, backward, underprivileged, handicapped and the sick within the Tibetan community in exile. Along with that it also aims for the promotion of social welfare, promotion of rural development, promotion of religious and charitable purpose such as the establishment of funds for welfare of military orphans. It also aims for the welfare of political sufferers. And other main objective is to coordinate, to rehabilitate and settle Tibetan refugees. Here the coordination is established between individual voluntary agencies and the Indian government. Now note that this committee has great linkages with uh, Indian government because as I already said it is registered under Indian Society Registration Act only. And further for receiving funds the committee is registered under FCRA that is Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. It was registered in 1985 itself. So this helps the committee to receive donation in cash or kind for development purposes. And because of this, all the reports and the accounts of the funds that is received by the committee are submitted to the Home Ministry of Government of India. And further note that it includes uh, members from 53 Tibetan settlements in India, Nepal and Bhutan. And this committee is also dependent on generous international assistance from governments, especially these three countries that is India, Nepal and Bhutan and also from philanthropic organizations and individuals. So in this manner only government of India is providing assistance in the form of grants in aid to this committee. So these are the points that you have to remember regarding Dalai Lama's Central Tibetan Relief Committee. Now let us get to the next discussion. So now let us take up this news article. It says that Tamil Nadu Chief Minister has written to our Prime Minister to immediately withdraw the Common University Entrance Test. And the reason behind this letter is any entrance examination based on NCRT syllabus will not provide an equal opportunity to all students who had studied in varied state board syllabus across the country. This is a valid point because state board students constitute more than 80% of total student population and they come from marginalized sections. So according to the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister, this Central University Entrance Test should be withdrawn. In this manner, let us see few facts about this entrance test. So we all know about the National Testing Agency, right? It was established by the Ministry of Education for conducting efficient, transparent and international standards test. 
and these tests are required to assess the competency of candidates for admissions to premier higher education institutions now this nta is also assigned the task of conducting central universities common entrance test which is cu cet the cu cet was conducted for undergraduate and integrated uh, courses and also for postgraduate programs it was conducted for 12 participating central universities as you can see here so this uh, cu cet is conducted for admission to different programs of the participating central universities it also provides a single window opportunity to the students to seek admission in the participating institutes or universities now the game changer here is university grants commission has announced the introduction of common university entrance test so just now we saw about cu cet now i am talking about cu et now the cu et has been made mandatory for undergraduate admission at any of the 45 central universities in the country so what is the cu et it is the revamped version of cu cet and as per the announcement cu et will be conducted for the admissions to 45 central universities in india therefore students of class 12 will be eligible to appear for entrance exam and it will be conducted in online mode by the national testing agency now what is the need for having the cu et the need stated by the government is that for the last many years there is a trend of uh, skyrocketing uh, cutoffs at several central universities including the delhi university for admissions to undergraduate courses and as per the courses this high cutoff is because of cbsc ciesc and other different state boards in india because they all have different evaluation patterns so it is unfair for the students who are applying to central universities with a wide diversity in evaluation patterns therefore a single common entrance test was demanded and because of this only the cuet will be conducted for everyone who is applying at these 45 central universities some of the major central universities covered in this are delhi university jawaharlal nehru university jamia millia islamia igno that is indira gandhi national open university then aligarh muslim university banaras hindu university etc and note that after conducting the exam nta will prepare a merit list and based on this only central universities will admit the students so with these facts in mind now let us get to the last session of the day which is practice questions discussion session and i have uh, three practice questions for you and one quiz question let us take up the practice question now this is the first question consider the following statements with respect to the impeachment of president of india statement 1 is impeachment procedure of president is based on parliamentary convention this is incorrect obviously the impeachment procedure of indian president is as per the indian constitution it is mentioned in article 61 of the constitution so since we know that statement 1 is incorrect we can eliminate option a and option c because here the question asks for the correct statements now let us see the remaining statements statement 2 only elected members of both houses of parliament participate in the impeachment procedure now this statement is also incorrect so during discussion we saw that during the election of president there is an electoral college and this electoral college has elected members of both the houses of parliament and the elected members of legislative assemblies of states but in case of impeachment of president only the elected members and nominated members of parliament participate but the elected members of legislative assemblies of the states does not participate in presidential impeachment so here the statement states only elected members so this statement is incorrect because the nominated members of parliament also participate in the impeachment procedure the moment you know this statement is also incorrect we arrive at the correct answer which is option d none of the above so that means statement 3 is also incorrect let us see what it states it mentions during impeachment proceeding a resolution has to be passed by a majority of not less than 2/3 members present in voting now at the face of it this statement might look correct but pay attention here it should be not less than 2/3 members of the total membership of the house so generally in upsc here the 2/3 would be mentioned as 1/3 but for a change the question could be asked like this also here the 2/3 members of the total membership of the house is the correct one so the correct answer is option d now let us take up the next question consider the following statements with reference to the common university entrance test first statement cuet will be conducted by national testing agency this statement is correct we saw it during discussion itself second statement it is mandatory for admission at any university in the country now this statement is incorrect as of now this may become true in the future 
See, as of now, UGC has announced the CUET as mandatory for undergraduate admissions at any of 45 central universities in the country, not all of the universities. So, this makes statement 2 as incorrect. And here, the question also asks for the correct statements. So, the correct answer is option A, 1 only. Now, let us take up this next question on Mission Vatsalya. First statement is, the mission is implemented under the Ministry of Women and Child Development. This statement is correct. See, there are three umbrella schemes of Ministry of Women and Child Development as of now. They are Mission Poshan 2.0, Mission Shakti and Mission Vatsalya. Now, let us take up the second statement. Its objective is to ensure safety and security of women and strive for the empowerment of women. See, among the three umbrella schemes of the ministry, Mission Shakti is for women and Mission Vatsalya is for children. So, from this itself, you can identify that statement 2 is incorrect. Mission Vatsalya is to secure a healthy and happy childhood for every child in India. And the objective which I have given here, it is the objective of Mission Shakti. So, here statement 2 is incorrect. And look at the question here. It asks for the incorrect statements. So, be careful while marking the right answer. The right answer is option B, 2 only. So, with these three questions, now let us take up the quiz question for the day. It is based on the Central Tibetan Relief Committee discussion of today. Try to answer this question in the comment section. And if you are unable to answer, go back to the discussion again and then try to attend this question. So, these were the prelims questions. Now, let us take up the practice question in mains. This is a question in GS paper 2. You have to answer this question in 150 words. Interested aspirants can write answer to this question and post it in the comment section. And whenever we get time, we'll review your answer. So finally, we have come to the end of uh, Hindi News Analysis for 7th of April. If you like this video, don't forget to like, comment and share. And also subscribe to Shankar IS Academy YouTube channel for receiving regular updates. Thank you.